Dear Father, thank you for another quarter you've given us uh, and one of the most interesting books in the New Testament, uh, really the most explosive uh, letter of Paul because of his passion for the purity of the gospel. We pray that as we look into his authority as an apostle and the uh, uncompromising stance he had on the good news of salvation in Jesus, that we will be strengthened and we will be motivated to take the same stand for you and deepen our faith in your saving grace displayed in your Son. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so um, we just finished a quarter uh, on First and Second Peter. And if you notice in Second Peter, Peter alluded to the books of Paul, right? There, there's, there's a portion there uh, talking about the books of Paul. That's one of the evidences that uh, the canon, I mean, the canon of the New Testament was being developed even during the time of Peter. Remember, Peter was uh, martyred right about the middle 65 AD. So right about 65 AD, they already, the church already recognized the authenticity and the authority of the Pauline epistles, okay? So that was a good, good, good relationship between the two. But now, when you go to Galatians, there was another encounter between Paul and Peter. This is not as favorable in 2 Peter. Because what happened in the encounter, if you read Galatians, um, Peter was eating among the Gentiles. And the description is, among the uncircumcised Gentiles. And then when some of the Jews came, and they were taunting the Gentiles, you know how the Jews treated uh, Peter left, you know, left the group so he can join the Jews. Paul was offended. So what do you do that? You know, how, how, can, how hypocritical can you be? All right, so that's why, that's why I like the Bible. It doesn't sugarcoat what's real. Uh, and, and for those who, who spouse the doctrine that Peter was the first pope, that is infallible, you can see right in Galatians the fallibility of, of Peter, right? And he was humble enough to get the, uh, you know, the, the correction and the rebuke of Paul. And the reason why Paul rebuked Peter is because Paul is very strong when it comes to the gospel. So I, was, I was telling you earlier before we uh, rolled the camera. So I taught, a, I taught uh, New Testament and social science to, the, to take the place of my professor in college who left for Singapore for, half, for a semester. So when I started, um, there was, uh, he told me, being one of the subjects you'll be carrying would be uh, New Testament theology. And part of the New Testament theology is Galatians. Uh, he said, you will have fun teaching Galatians. Why? This is only, this, well, Paul doesn't mince words in Galatians. You know, there's a part there, Galatians 2. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? That's a very, very weak translation in English, okay? If I pick my own translation, it's worse than foolish, okay? But he literally badmouths the Galatians. Why was he so upset? He was so upset because they were compromising the gospel. And we will go to that in a little while, okay? So, but before that, I'd like, you to give, I'd like to give a context as to what the Pauline epistles are. So, I gave you a handout. This one is gray and back to back, all right? Um, this will give you a better chronology of what uh, transpired when Paul wrote his epistles, okay? So you can read that uh, for your reading pleasure after presentation. Flip the page, much rather go here. It will be a lot, uh, a lot more understandable. In fact, they're saying to remember this uh, chart, you just think of 6, 4, 2, 1, okay? When we say 6, 4, 2, 1, during the missionary tours, he wrote six epistles. And those six epistles were Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Romans. And then in his, during his first imprisonment in Rome, he wrote Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, and Philippians. That's why it's called prison epistles, the prison letters. They were written while, while Paul was uh, in prison. He was released. And after he was released, he wrote to Timothy, that was 1st Timothy, and to Titus. And then for his second imprisonment, in the final imprisonment of Paul before he was martyred in Rome, supposedly he was decapitated under the regime of Nero, 
uh, he wrote the second Timothy that's why second Timothy is the swan song of Paul that was the last letter he wrote before he was martyred killed for the cause of Jesus Christ what what was the first letter he wrote he wrote the book of Galatians Galatians is the first one of the earliest written books of the New Testament okay in terms of Paul that was the first letter that he wrote uh, very quickly right below it these are the summaries of what uh, the major themes were in his books of course Romans deals with uh, salvation you know Christ is our power okay the gospel shown as a message in Christ we are justified okay he was presented from Corinth that's what that's the source it is the approximate date these are the, the cross-reference to Acts. If you want to know the biblical background, you can go to Acts 20 and you will see the background of this. is, again, a good cross-reference for you to understand where the book was written, why it was written, who were receiving it, what was the major thrust of the book. That's why if you want to learn about salvation, you want to be evangelistic, I've been hearing it, what books of Paul do you want to emphasize? Romans and Galatians, those are evangelistic epistles. If you want to go with church growth and spiritual gifts, you go to 1st and 2nd Corinthians, okay? And then uh, if you want exhortations, uh, that's why you got Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, and Philippians. Um, this will, again, help you. If you just look at this big summary right here, then you will understand where Paul was coming from. Why did Paul write Galatians? What was going on in Galatians? Okay, let me explain the background. How many members did the church have when it started in Pentecost? How many met in the upper room? You remember? Well, 120 Jews were up in the upper room. So the church started with 120 members. All of them were Jews. Okay? The Holy Spirit was poured on the church during Pentecost Peter preaches a very powerful sermon. How many were baptized? 3,000 3, were baptized. Just like that. They became 3,120. That's a membership. They did not have a church like this. They didn't have the facilities. So most of them were meeting in the homes. And they were also meeting, well, in the synagogues were occupied by the Jews. So they were meeting in the homes. And then shortly after that, you read Acts. Another 5,000 men. This is just all 5,000 men were added to the church. And because another 5,000 men was added, without the women, you would think the church was exploding to about 10,000 in a matter of days. All right, now that's okay. We know that the church, under the power of the Spirit, will grow. But there is one very unique phenomenon that was introduced of because of this. According to one commentator, you will be lucky to track down 1,000 Jewish Christians for the first century. In other words, how many Jews were converted to Christianity? I said, you'll be lucky to detect about 1,000 of the Jews, which means if there were thousands of Christians in the first century and only about 1,000 of the Jews, what kind of Christians were they? They were Gentile Christians. Here is the biggest problem. When Jesus commissioned the apostles to go out, the disciples to go out and preach the gospel, where, they were, where, where were they supposed to begin? In Jerusalem, and then where? In Samaria, and into the uttermost part of the earth. In other words, Jesus is saying, you preach the gospel where? Right among your people first, among the Jews. So because they concentrated on the first command of Jesus Christ, they had this idea that the gospel was only for the Jews. All of a sudden, you got thousands of non-Jews coming into the church. How will you handle this? Now, it creates a cultural conflict. Why does it create a cultural conflict? Because the culture of the Gentiles was very different from the culture of the Jews. So now you got two cultures clashing within the body of Jesus Christ. How do you handle that? All right? And today, you studied in your Sabbath school classes the origin of Paul from Saul. All right? How he was converted. How, how passionate was Paul for the gospel of Jesus. He was so passionate, he was dragging people off their houses, literally throwing them in prison and probably putting them to death. Uh, some commentators are saying that the predecessor of Paul, or at least the, the metaphor that they use for Paul is Phineas 
and Elijah. Phineas was one of the children of the, pro, of the priest. Remember when Balaam and Balak, you know, Balaam was supposed to, to curse the children of Israel and King Balak was giving him a lot of money, the, you know, and the donkey spoke, blah, 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 blah. And try as they may, he could then curse the children of Israel because God wouldn't let him. How did he find a way to destroy the children of Israel? Not, to, not by cursing him. What he did was he introduced the pagan woman among the men of the children of Israel. So through immorality, what happened? The children of Israel fell. Now let me tell you what happened. When the, the, child, the men of the children of the Jews were so enamored with this Canaanite woman, they were very seductive. There was one convocation of the entire nation one day, and this guy was so blatant in his disobedience, he dragged a Canaanite woman into his tent while people were meeting. It always went like there's a church service going on, and he grabs a woman and takes it to his tent and does something there which is X-rated. And then the priest knew what was going on. There was a high-handed scene in the God. And you know what Phineas did? He got a spear, went into the tent, and thrust a spear into the midsection of the body all the way to the woman. It's like barbecue, okay? Both of them died. Why? Because he wanted to preserve the purity of God's people. That's defiling. How, how passionate was this man, Phineas? He was so passionate, he was willing to kill in the name of Judaism, in the name of Jewish religion. Now, uh, jump to Elijah. What happened to Elijah? Elijah battled the, the prophets of Baal and Mount Carmel. And you know the story, right? The, the, they were chanting, they were lacerating the bodies. Nothing was going on. It's Elijah's turn came. They poured water, and when he prayed, it was like gasoline. It burned the offering. What did Elijah do after he won the battle? He slaughtered hundreds of the priests of Baal. So they're saying because the, the, the paradigm or the viewpoint of this, this passion, okay, the zeal for the Jewish religion was displayed in the life of Phineas and in the life of Elijah, the same zeal was eating up Paul. Because for him, he needed to have zeal to defend his religion, okay? Question, uh, did Paul believe in Jesus Christ? Of course not. For starters, he did not. Saul did not believe. Okay? When was Saul converted? Okay, a lot of commentators placed the conversion of Paul three years after Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. That's three years after Jesus. That's why when you go to the 70-week prophecy, remember in the middle of the week, the, the Messiah will be cut off. In the end of the week, the gospel will be given to the Gentiles. You've got 31 and 34. So there's three years in between. So in between those three years, Paul was, was terrorizing the Christians. What? In the name of defending the Jewish religion. All right? Uh, you, you know, you, you shake your head when you read the papers today. Man, several people got decapitated by ISIS in the Middle East. Man, somebody got buried, you know, up to the neck, and they stoned this person to death who happens to be a Christian. You know, the, how barbaric you say that. That was happening during the time of Paul. And to top it off, who was the first Christian martyr? It was Stephen, who was one of the most powerful deacons that was ordained. How did Stephen die? Death by stoning. Who sanctioned the stoning of Stephen? It was Paul. So if Paul were alive today, he's just like an ISIS fighter who will be willing to slaughter anybody, who can kill anybody in the name of his religion. That was how fanatical he was. So you think to yourself, I'm hopeless. God cannot accept me anymore. Look at this guy. There was no hope for this guy to be a Christian. What did God do? He pried him off that fanaticism. He had an encounter with Jesus. He turned around. He became the most powerful evangelist in the New Testament. According to Bible writers, the nearest apostle in terms of sanctification, growth in the Christian life, the apostle Paul was a hundred miles behind. And yet he never boasted. Towards the end of his life, he said, I've been shipwrecked so many times, I have been stoned. 
I was hungry. I went through all of this for the sake of Jesus Christ. And I count everything that I've done as loss for the glory of knowing Jesus Christ. You see the contrast between Paul and Saul and Paul. It's amazing how God transformed him. And I was just listening to a commentary on this. You know, three times he had the 39 lashes. You know why, what, why it's called 39 lashes? Because one short, one more, you're going to die. Why, why, why will you die? Because what are the lashes for? If you, if you watch the, the Passion of the Christ, right? you, you got the whip. And at the edge of the, the whip are metals and pieces of bone. So that when they hit you, it buries itself into your skin. And when you pull that whip, it takes skin away. So they're saying if Paul was beaten three times, the body of Paul was nothing more than scars. And for those who have plastic surgery to look good, there was nothing you can do for Paul. All that was left for him were scars that healed because of the beating. They said, let alone all the stoning that he... But Paul endured all of this because of his passion for the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say more, so more when you look at the life of Paul, more than the fervor and the quality of his preaching and passion for Christ, you look at the first part of his life and you say, there's hope for us. Yeah. I mean, yeah. how bad, sure. how, you know, sure. how low can you go without God? Sure. And he never misses you. Sure. And he has his eye on you all the time. Sure. Because you can take Paul, that was actually using his name to persecute God's people. Sure. I mean, how low can you get? Sure. And, and one of my favorite illustrations when this, when this restoration and God's calling comes into play is Jeffrey Dahmer. You got, remember, I always lose this illustration. You know who Jeffrey Dahmer is, right? Yeah. Jeffrey Dahmer is this guy who kidnapped young boys. Um, he raped those boys and chopped them into pieces, stored them in his freezer, and started eating those boys. That's why the judge was saying, you're an animal, you're not a man, you're not a human being. Uh, interestingly, two weeks before Jeffrey Dahmer was murdered in the kitchen, the high security prison cell in Wisconsin, one of the inmates really hated the guts of Jeffrey Dahmer. So he was one of the inmates who killed him in the, prison, in the kitchen of the prison cell. Two weeks before that, Jeffrey Dahmer accepted Jesus Christ, supposedly. There were two pastors who visited Jeffrey Dahmer, and Jeffrey Dahmer accepted Jesus Christ. Okay, so here's always my question. If in fact that conversion was true and he accepted Jesus Christ, will you see Jeffrey Dahmer in heaven? Well, I, I was giving this, this Bible study in Manila. There was a bunch of people there, you know, like businessmen and what have you, very sophisticated guys. And I told the story of Jeffrey Dahmer and asked them, you think God should forgive Jeffrey Dahmer? <laughs> I went like this. Yeah. I mean, you can say, okay, what, what if one of those boys were your kid? Right. You, you, you're claiming for justice, right? But that's grace. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a scandal of grace. I mean, you think you're better than the other guy because you've seen less than the other guy. I mean, all of us are the same before God and all of us. That's why I, I end up that illustration. If Jeffrey Dahmer cannot be forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. All of us will be in trouble. But that's, that's the example that we have. I mean, Jeffrey Dahmer was immoral. He was just weird. He was a pervert. He was just a, a, a psychological abnormality, if you want to put it this way, a fanatical abnormality. But worse, Paul did not only pervert the Christianity. He actually killed people in the name of his religion, and yet God called him. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. All right, so, so you, have that, you have that issue, and let, let's very quickly go to, if you read Galatians 1 all the way to chapter 2, we will see the, the timeline. I like this. If, if you go to YouTube and look for the name John Lennox, uh, not John Lennox, uh, this guy. So, I, I, because I cannot give you all the details, I'll summarize it. Gary Habermas. Gary Habermas uh, is, uh, is, the, is the pastor, a theologian, recognized to be the expert when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He visits Ivy League schools. He went to Oxford. He went to Harvard. 
He goes all over the place defending the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why is he able to do that? Because when he was pursuing his doctorate in the University of Michigan, he did not go to a religious seminary. He ended up going to a public university. And then the, the, in the doctoral program, the advisors asked him, what, uh, what would be the topic of your dissertation? I will deal with the res resurrection of Christ. Can you buy that? The panel said, yes, we can, as long as you don't use Christian, uh, Christian arguments for the resurrection. Give us facts. If you can give us facts, we will accept it. He did. And if you give, Google him, if you go to YouTube, uh, so far, he has collected over 10,000 evidences about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's saying it is the most undisputed, the most undisputed historical event that happened. When I say undisputed, I'm not even, uh, even talking about inspirational New Testament. I'm just talking about secular evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. And I'll give you an example. He, he talks about his friend who happens to be an atheist. He says, ah, I don't like the Gospels. Because the Gospels, they change a lot of uh, the words in the Gospel. Why? Because it was written like 60, 65 years after Jesus Christ. Oh, really? Huh? You don't like the Gospels? Because it was written 65 years ago. Do you know Alexander the Great? Yeah, so the guy goes, yes. Uh, do you know the earliest existing manuscript that talks about Alexander the Great? How far is it from the death of Alexander? The earliest is about 300 something years. And the most reliable uh, manuscript to prove to you that Alexander is real and he died is 425 to 450 years by Arian and Plutarch, I'm going to say. And you don't like the 65 years of the gospel? <laughs> uh, that's, the wider the gap, the more, more likely it has changed, okay? So they're saying, yeah, the gospels are 65 years after Jesus. They're dating it to John, okay, about 95 when John died, John the Revelator. Uh, that's why there's the canonization. Hopefully we'll have time to discuss this in the future. But the reason why the canon was closed at the end of the first century, one requirement of a, a, a book in the canon is you must be an apostle or must work very closely with an apostle to be an eyewitness to record what Jesus and the apostles did. Who was the last apostle to die? John, right? He wasn't martyred. John did, and he died before 100 AD. So the last apostle died. If he, if, if he died, most likely the associates of the apostles were, were dead by 100 AD. So you cannot have any other apostle writing about the New Testament over 100 AD. So the canonization was already there. Okay? But here's the point, and I'd like you to, it's, it's, not, in your, it's not in your handout. Paul is the number one evidence of Gary Habermas in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's look at Galatians 1. If you have, if you have Galatians 1. Um, so we have, we have the, if you notice, Paul was converted on his way to Damascus, right? And then he was blinded, and you know the story, right? God had to call Ananias, and Ananias went to Paul. Uh, prayed for Paul, the scales came off his eyes, he began to see again. After Ananias ministered to Paul, he shared Jesus to Paul, Paul experienced his conversion in Damascus. He was in Damascus. So as soon as you get converted into Christianity from Judaism, where do you go? You will naturally say, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll visit with the leaders of the church, right? And if I were supposed to visit with the leaders of the church, where are the leaders of the church? You know, Paul, in Jerusalem. So I should go to Jerusalem and talk to the apostles and, and, you know, and, and tell them, hey, I'm not killing you guys anymore. I, I'm part of you, you know, we're now on the same side, we're doing the same thing. Where did Paul go? If you read Galatians 1 all the way to chapter 2, he first went to Arabia. Spent three years in Arabia. Okay? After he spent three years in Arabia, he went back to Damascus. Only then did he proceed to Jerusalem. All right? And then, let's go to Galatians. If you have uh, your Bibles, let's go to Galatians. Uh, I think it's Galatians 2. Somebody read uh, verse 1. Again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, 
I took Titus along also. All right, so he gets converted three years after Jesus died. Okay, that's if he died, Jesus died 31 AD. That's about 34 AD. Okay. Uh, after he gets converted, he goes to Arabia for three years. Let's write it. There's the timeline here. So you have 34 AD. That's his conversion. And then three years in Arabia, that takes him to 37 AD. All right? And then according to this, he goes to Jerusalem. And he didn't find all the apostles. Oh, he only found James, the brother of Jesus. All right? Since he found James, the brother of Jesus, he started talking. What do you think Paul talked to James about? Uh, how's Jerusalem? How's the weather in Jerusalem? <laughs> he said, it's good to move here. No, no, no. He went to Jerusalem for one reason. He wanted to verify that what he believes in is the same thing that James believes in. He wants confirmation from James that if I ever go and be a missionary and preach the gospel, that the gospel I'm going to be preaching is the same gospel that you're preaching since you were there. So that's, that's what happens, okay? And then after that, clear, you read it, it took another 14 years for him to go back to Jerusalem. That was the second trip. It was during the time when there, were, there was a, a problem with, uh, with hunger, okay? So add 14 to this, what do you get? About 51. All right. All right, about 51, he goes back to Jerusalem. And when he goes back to Jerusalem, you read in Acts, he finds three of the biggest names in Christianity, who were the, first, the three apostles when he went back to Jerusalem. There was James, there was Peter, and there was John. I mean, who else could you look for in the early church? You know, James, James, James this, this, is not the, this is not the apostle James. This is James, the brother of Jesus, okay? Remember, James, the brother of Jesus, was a skeptic. He thought that his brother was a loony. Right? Jesus was out of his mind. And then he was the one of the first converts after Jesus resurrected from the dead. So both James and Paul were skeptics. That's why they're very strong arguments for the reality of the resurrection because both of these guys died for Jesus Christ. Why will you die for a lie? Why will you die if Jesus didn't arise from the dead? James was the first one to be martyred, and then Paul followed suit. So, so Paul goes to Jerusalem, and then he talks to Peter, James, and John, the three most authoritative apostles during, during the time in the church. And what did he talk about? Somebody read Galatians 2, verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepted no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Wow, what's the last part there? Added nothing. Do you know what that means? He has been preaching for 14 years. Yeah, this is this, this, this time right here. For 14 years, he did his missionary journeys and went through all the cities in Asia Minor, preaching the gospel of Christ boldly. And he said, I want to go back to Jerusalem once more to confirm that what I've been preaching was right. Who do I talk to? I talk to the number one hunchos, James, Peter, and John. He talks to Peter and John. What did he say? They added nothing to what I said because what I was preaching was the same gospel that they were preaching. That's very powerful. You know how powerful that is? His message didn't come from him. His message came from God, directly from these guys. Okay, if that was the case, right about this time, there was already belief that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, right? 37 AD, and Jesus came back. It was confirmed, it was confirmed by James when Paul went to Jerusalem. All right. Now, there's something very interesting. What he confirmed was what has been preached by the apostles already. So since he was only confirming it here in 37, he must, they must have been preaching it before 37, right? So right about the time Stephen was being stoned, were they already preaching the gospel here? Yes, they were. So the gospel story was as early as 34. You guys are talking three years after the resurrection. You, are, you say, are you seeing the impact of that in terms of history? Historical evidence, they say, if you're 50, 100 years from the actual event, that's already great as a historian. This is three years. Okay, and there's something very interesting. 
there are three things in the early text that you want to follow. Uh, like the, there are three S's. One is schooling. Somebody be kind enough to go to 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 1, uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's in uh, the first five verses. Oh, verses 1 and 2. No longer, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. It's also what you receive in which you stand, and which also you are saved, if you hold fast. All right, what did Paul say? It, this, is the, this is the most explicit definition of the gospel from Paul. 1 Corinthians 15. What did he say there? What did he preach? What does it say in the passage? He preached the gospel he what? He received. In other words, he did not invent it. It came from somebody else. He received it from somebody. Somebody had to tell it to him. So it did not originate from Paul. If somebody received, if Paul received it from somebody else, then that must have existed before Paul received it. Are you following? Uh, and you, I, I just read it real quickly for the sake of time. If you go to Romans 1, 2 to 4, this gospel he promised before and through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was a descendant of David, blah, 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 who died, you know, and rose from the dead. And then you, you can read this. This is what they call creedal statements. When I say creedal statements, these are doctrinal summaries. If you read the New Testament, there are passages in the New Testament which are formalized doctrines. You know what formalized doctrines are? It's just like the Apostles' Creed or the 28 Fundamentals. Okay? Uh, how do you know you're an Adventist? The closest thing I can do to you is I'll take you to 28 Fundamentals. If you read the 28 Fundamentals, that's who I am. That's what I believe in. These are doctrinal formulations. These doctrinal formulations were already existing as early as 34 AD. Right? Second, he's singing. There are at least two songs in the New Testament. There's more. Colossians 1, 15 to 20 and Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Let me just repeat that so you can just write it. Colossians 1, 15 to 20 and Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Uh, I will not read it anymore for the sake of time. But there were thousands of new converts to the church. Most of the new converts were no read, no write. They were illiterate. So if you have illiterate members of the church, you got to understand this. I mean, how many of you have seen somebody who cannot read, cannot write? I did. During one of our mission trips to the Philippines, we had to stop over in Tokyo. And right by the counter, the Japanese lady was saying, Anyone speak English? Anyone speak English? Because there was a Filipino flying from Chicago who was in a wheelchair. He was strong. He was only in a wheelchair because he couldn't communicate. He couldn't read. He couldn't write. And he could not speak. He couldn't speak Japanese, of course. And then, so uh, he really didn't want somebody who could speak English. He wanted somebody who could speak in Filipino. <laughs> so I was there. I had to translate for him. It was very difficult. I couldn't give him something to read because he couldn't read. So what do you do to the, in the church if there are a lot of people who were slaves and illiterate? How do you educate them? Yes, through songs. Somebody writes this in verses and people start singing it. That's why today, even if people cannot read and write, if they sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, they sing it even if they cannot read it, they know the doctrine. And this is very prevalent in the first century. In the early church, people were singing the doctrines. How long does it take to come up with a song after the event. Let me be more specific. How long did it take for them to come up with songs to celebrate the dying and the rising and the ascending of Jesus Christ? According to one New Testament scholar, it took them less than six months to up, up with a song. Are you, are you following this? When, when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel that I received, that means I received from the schooling, the doctrines of the church, and from the singing of the church, I receive it from the church. Since I receive it from them, when did it start? It started, they said that Christ was crucified the spring. It was in spring. 
So before the year ended, there was already a song about his death and his resurrection. In the same year, there was already a record about Jesus Christ. That's amazing. That's why, I mean, I, I cannot emphasize this stronger than Gary Habermas. I invite you to watch Gary Habermas. He spends about an hour, you know, doing how human PowerPoint, following what the New Testament was saying. How can you refute that event historically you have them it's almost like current events right there in the same year there was a testimony that jesus rose from the dead yeah Did you colossians 1:15 yeah, the... to 20 and philippians 2 5 to 11. okay and thirdly these are the texts this doesn't even talk about inspiration these are just these are just historical texts in other words, if you don't believe in the inspiration, just read the secular text. I mean, based on the rules of historical accuracy, if you got all these evidences, these are very strong. What is the third? It's the sacraments of the church. There were two rites that the, the church had to go through. There was the rite of baptism and the rite of the Lord's Supper. These were very consistently followed and done by the early church every week. Following me? That's why there are people are asking, how often should we celebrate communion? And then somebody said, why don't we celebrate it every week? That's what the early church did. <laughs> and the board said, it's expensive. <laughs> so, 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 so the pastor said, do you feel the same way about the offering? <laughs> why, why do we like collect offering every week? Why don't you just collect it every quarter? You know, so, I mean, then you're very biased. All, and I'm an advocate for this. The more communion we have in the church, the better. In fact, that's, that's where I appreciate the Catholics are. Because when they go to Mass, the Catholics expect to participate in the Eucharist. Whenever they go to church, church is not complete without participating in the Eucharist, which is like they have communion. They, they eat of the bread. There's a different interpretation. But we do it every quarter. Who told us to do it every quarter? Eh, denominational policy, okay? So, yeah, it's, a, it's not from the Bible. It's common sense, yeah. But really, I think the, the more we spend time on the table, that's the reason why people, a lot of young people don't appreciate the rites, sacraments of the church, is because we don't celebrate them more often. If we celebrate them more often, we have more baptisms, the more people will appreciate it. But this is the bottom line. There were doctrinal summaries in the early church. There were songs about Jesus Christ. And there were rituals testifying that if you're baptized, you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the moment you celebrate the Lord's Supper, they say, This do ye in remembrance of me, my body broken and my blood spilled for you. All three of these testify the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, uh, that is just a, a, a foretaste of what you will hear from Gary Habermas. It's one of my favorite apologies. I always tell my friends, when you encounter a skeptic, where do you start? Don't try to outsmart the guy, yeah? because you can win the argument and lose the guy. What you want to do is look for his need for Christ, and then introduce Christ to that need. And I'm pretty sure he became a skeptic not because he didn't believe intellectually. A lot of skeptics stopped believing because they were hurt in their experience. They experienced tragedy in their life. So only God and only Jesus can heal that bomb. So you've you got to find out, you know, pray to God when you get there, you introduce Jesus Christ to them, and they will be healed through the bomb of Jesus Christ. But the bottom line I'd like to say right now is, why is the resurrection important? <laughs> Gary Habermas is saying, well, a lot of people today in the Christian church debate whether you should be Calvinist or Armenian. Should you believe in predestination or should you believe in free choice? A lot of people debate, uh, do you believe that the bread during the Holy Communion is actually the bread of Jesus Christ or turns into the just symbolic blah, blah. There's also debate whether you should ordain male or female pastors in the church. There's a lot of debates. And Gary Habermas is saying, yes, you can debate all of those. But you cannot debate the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Because if you lose those three, you have nothing left. That's why, that's a long time, huh? Let's just go back to the outline for this coming Sabbath. Three M's. Talk about the man, we talk about this message, and we talk about the mandate of Galatians. Who's the man? You read Galatians 1, he's an apostle of Christ. 
You go to Galatians 1 verse 12, he did not receive it from man, he received it from God. Just to summarize this, why? Because did Jesus see, uh, did Paul see Jesus personally? Yes, he did. But he saw the resurrected Jesus. He did not see Jesus while he was on earth. And yet, did he really see Jesus Christ? Yes, he did. Okay, and if you jump to 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, he talks about a man that went up to heaven, right? A man that went up to heaven back. He was being very modest. He was talking about that man. He was that man who was taken up to heaven by God. Although you will not read any description of what God showed him when he went to heaven, he did go to heaven. In other words, he had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ and God himself based on his own testimony. Now, how, how strong is that argument? According to Gary Habermas, Paul is the darling of all secular critics. When I say secular critics, critics who do not believe in Christianity, they love Paul. Why do they love Paul? Because he was educated, right? Under Gamaliel, he was a student of the law. He was a very, very exact writer. So they like him. So if this writer is not disillusioned and he died for his faith, and he tells you he had the vision, he's not telling a lie. So where did he receive the gospel? He received the gospel from God himself. All right, so this is my favorite part of the... So he's an apostle. What, what, what makes an apostle? You must be an eyewitness of the Christ. Is Paul an eyewitness of the Christ? He spends a lot of time in Corinthians. He spends a lot of time in Galatians defending his apostleship. Okay? And we already discussed his life. Uh, what was the message of Apostle Paul? Somebody read Galatians 1.9. It's one of the strongest messages that, that was written about the gospel here. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. Wow. If you read that passage in the scriptures in Galatians 1, he said, he doesn't care. Even if an angel, even if an angel preaches another gospel to you, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. Follow me carefully. Did Paul know his gospel? Yes, he did. How, how did he know it? It was revealed to him by Jesus Christ. Despite the fact that it was revealed to him, he still went. Due diligence, he tried to confirm it with the apostles. How many times did he confirm it? Twice. He confirmed it with James and he confirmed it with Peter, James, and John. I receive it from God. This is what I've been preaching in all the cities, in all my missionary journeys. Am I preaching the truth? Peter, James, and John, I cannot add anything to what you're saying because you're saying the same thing. He knew his gospel. Was that gospel the pure gospel which we cannot compromise? Yes, it is. I guess the biggest question, about five minutes, I got to wrap up. What was the gospel that Paul preached? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 15. The gospel that Paul, Paul preaches, let me just summarize it right now. We'll probably have more time to discuss this. It's, this has been called JBF. That's why Galatians is, is, is said to be the book of Martin Luther. That was the book of the Reformation. It, it's called the Magna Carta of Christian Liberty or Christian Freedom. Okay? Because Galatians is very heavy on freedom in Jesus Christ. The problem with the Galatians was there were so many Gentile believers coming into the church. And what were the Gentile believers saying? Oh, we believe in Jesus Christ because he's our Savior. And the Jew said, no way, you cannot be part of God's kingdom unless you become a Jew first. In other words, you got to be circumcised. You got to do all of this legal stuff. Uh, let me just jump here to apply it right away. It's so, so quaint today that when we do evangelism, we Adventize people more than we Christianize them. <laughs> I'm coning terms here. In other words, unless you, unless you smell and taste and walk like an Adventist, you will not be saved. That was a problem with Galatians. They were mixing up what men can do with what God has done in Jesus Christ. And if you add something to what Jesus has done, what will happen? You will corrupt what Jesus has done. Tell me, tell, tell me, really, tell me really quickly. This was a, a very good trick question that was asked by one book, an excellent writer. He said, is Jesus Christ's righteousness perfect? Yes. Is your righteousness and my righteousness perfect? No. What happens if I mix my righteousness with the righteousness of Jesus Christ? It becomes imperfect. 
That's why the war cry of the Reformation is what? Sola. Sola, why is sola? The Catholics believe that we are saved by faith. Okay? But they believe that you are saved by faith and works. Faith plus works. Or you are saved by faith, okay, that has worked through you in the Holy Spirit. And this is a, it's a very common doctrine among us. You are saved by sanctification and justification at the same time. What was the clamor of the Reformation? No, I cannot compromise it. Galatians 1, 8 and 9. If anybody else preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. Because the gospel says only Jesus can save you. You cannot add to what Jesus did. Because when you add to what Jesus did, it will corrupt the gospel. It will no longer be the gospel. I will, oh, that's why this will be a very interesting quarter, I'm telling you, especially for those who have a background in last generation theology and perfectionism in the church. Because Galatians says you cannot be saved by anything that you do. You're only saved by what Jesus Christ has done. By faith. Yeah, so then people say, oh, look at that, look at that. That's why these people, they believe in salvation by faith. They do not obey the law anymore. <laughs> that, that, that's what, that's. That's not true. That's why we go to the last part. What's the mandate? Somebody please read Galatians 5.13 so we can end it properly there. Galatians 5.13 You, my brothers and sisters, are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge your flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Wow. He <laughs> said, in Jesus Christ, by faith alone in Him, you are free. But do not use your freedom to what? To indulge yourself, but rather serve each other humbly with love. What's the meaning of love? Romans 13, 5, love is the fulfilling of the law. In other words, if you really value your freedom, you know what you're going to do? You will obey the law, not because you want to be saved, but because you have been saved by Jesus Christ. That's why in Galatians 5 is what we go, we've studied this in one quarter, are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all of this. And then he mentions about violations of the commandments of God. Why is it called fruit? Because you do not, because you do not self-manufacture or self-engineer those. If you manufacture them, they will be fake. Well, I, I, I cannot overemphasize this. I'm telling you guys, if you try to love by trying to be loving... Try to be patient by trying to be patient. You can't count one to ten before you blow up. That's fake. Paul is saying, if you know the gospel, if you know that this came from Jesus Christ and how great that gift is to you, you will be so in love with Jesus, you will become like him and you will bear fruit. So really, instead of getting rid of the law, if you understand the gospel in Galatians, but the sponsor, you establish the law. The only way to truly really obey the law is to learn to love Jesus who saved you from your sins. And when you love Jesus Christ, you will love with his love and you'll be like him. And what better way to follow the commandments than to be like Jesus. Don't follow the letter of the law, but follow Jesus. And whatever Jesus does is perfect obedience to the Ten Commandments. That's in summary what Galatians is trying to say. And it's going to get, get more <laughs> exciting because he goes, you foolish Galatians. Talk about that, yeah. I like the yeah. New King James, but for that same verse, says, for you brethren have been called to liberty. Yeah. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Sure. Yeah. 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 And, 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 uh, he's basically saying it's, it's a contradiction if you say that you're a Christian mm -hmm. and you're immoral. It's a contradiction that if you say you're a Christian and you don't respect the law. How in the world will you hate something that your Savior who gave his life for you loves? And not hate what he hates. If you have accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will be like him. You know, I so love the sermon this morning. You know, it's a, seldom do I get really fed. And I was really fed this morning when I was listening to Sheldon. And... Uh, Come, drink. Why do you spend your money in things that will never satisfy? When you get it free. How do you get it free? Not with what you do, 
but with what he has given you. Terry was telling me, and let, let me end with this, with this illustration. Because I asked the question when I was teaching Sabbath school last Sabbath, um, are you ready? If Jesus were to come, will you be sure that you will be in heaven? And if somebody says he's sure, people think that you're proud. And yet, it's, it's very difficult. Whenever I ask that in congregation, whether it's a large or small congregation, I say, how many of you like for Jesus to come back soon? How many of you are sure that when Jesus comes back next week, if he comes back, that you'll be in heaven? <laughs> Why are they not sure? I'll go back to what I told there. Because you concentrate on what you do. A little more step, maybe I'll, I'll be closer to perfection. Maybe I'll be ready tomorrow because I haven't done enough. You'll never make it. So I always ask the question, and I've asked you this, where is Jesus when you commit your worst sin? People think, if you believe in perfectionism, you will be tempted to think that Jesus will leave you because you're committing really bad sins. But if you understand grace, Jesus is right there when you commit your worst sin. And although you are wallowing with the pigs, because you have nothing to eat and you want to eat with the pigs, if you remember the love of the Father, you will rise up and you will go back. What made him go back? Because he knew even in his filthy condition, God loved him, right? That's the gospel. Unfortunately, <laughs> people think, hey, you got to clean up first, take a shower before you go home. That's not the gospel. That's what Paul is saying. If an angel preaches that, let him be anathema. I'm telling you, if you come to Jesus right now, regardless of what's happening to you, he will accept you. Yeah. The secret in the Christian life is not doing, being good, it is just doing nothing wrong. The secret of a Christian life is willing to come to the presence of God. And if you need forgiveness, get that forgiveness. If you need blessings, you will get blessings. Yeah. I think sometimes people don't really understand the depravity of their sin. And the more, remember you always say, the more you look at Christ, the more you say to yourself how bad you are, and the more you need a Savior. And the more you need a Savior, the more you'll come to Christ. You, know? you, and, you, and you, you pray for me because I will deal with that this coming Sabbath when I, when I preach on Belshazzar. I guess that's not a good, Nebuchadnezzar was saved, Belshazzar died, right? It was the opposite, it was unbelief. And the reason why he was unbelief, that guy never feared God. He never believed in the wrath of God. They never believed in the judgment. That's being taught by the gospel. The judgment and the wrath of God are real. But you don't have to be subject to the wrath of God and be judged because Jesus already did that for you. You will only be subject to the judgment and the wrath of God if you do not accept Jesus Christ. Humble yourself. Well, how can you humble yourself if you sure. don't think you're wrong, if you don't, you don't, you don't know how bad sure. you are? Sure, and that's very important, Terry. You know why? Because here's the point. For so long, the, the favorite verse of Christians are John 3.16. You know what the favorite of verse of people now, even in Christian law? It's Matthew 7, two. What does Matthew 7, two say? Judge not that ye be not judge. And you hear this. I want to be in an environment which is non-judgmental. Dude. You know, it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes the judgment. Everybody dies, everybody will be judged, okay? I think what's wrong is when you preach judgment and you don't preach the gospel. But like Terry is saying, the gospel will not mean anything to you until you realize first that you're under the judgment of God. And that you need forgiveness, because if you don't need forgiveness, you will not ask for forgiveness, and everything that Christ has done is for naught. But one moment you realize that you are a filthy sinner, the worst sinner that you can think of, you will run to Jesus for forgiveness, and he's going to give you that forgiveness. Well, how will you be lost if you don't run to him anymore? When will you stop running to him? When you do not recognize that it is sola because you have a part in it. So what you need to do right now is as I end this is throw everything away, surrender. You cannot do it. Give everything to God because when you give everything to God, your good deeds, your bad deeds, Everything that you got, he's going to take it. He's going to make it good for you. Just be in his presence. That's the most important thing. If I went to heaven, it's because of what he oh, yeah. is. Nothing I do. How does Morris bend in it? I'll just, just be a nice illustration with pray. 
he, he was speaking one of the most challenging uh, 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 appointments he had he was asked to give the graduation speech to kindergartens <laughs> so he goes there more spending then he goes there so I wanted to be creative so I had to pull out one for sheet of paper I will not give you a quiz I'll just ask you one question when you get to heaven what would the first thing you will do as I he collected the paper and one guy said oh I'm gonna get look for the biggest lion open the mouth of the lion insert my head into that mouth okay because the lions don't bite anymore oh we're gonna look for David I gotta travel the stars he was getting getting very weary until he finds one sheet of paper of warm desire. You know what this little girl said? When I get to heaven, the first thing I'll do is to throw myself at Jesus' feet and thank him for making it possible for me to be there. Oh, you can get your lion, you can get your stars, man. But if you're looking for stars and lions, you will not be there. <laughs> if you're looking for Jesus right now, even now, you can have heaven in your heart. And if you die tomorrow, Jesus comes back, it doesn't matter. You're with Jesus Christ, and you'll be safe in his arms. Not because of what you do, but because of what he has done for you. That's the message of Galatians. Stop looking at yourself. The gospel is about Jesus, not about you. Look at Jesus Christ, and you will have surety, and you, have liberty. you will be free to do what you need to do in Jesus Christ, because he has already freed you from your sins. All right? That's why it's for prayer. Hey, Father, thank you for this time we've spent. I know there's more interesting lessons uh, that we will cover in this quarter. Give us open minds and responsive hearts that we might learn to appreciate the gospel more and find surety in Jesus every day by being with him in his presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.